Welcome to Fuel Podcast. I'm your host, Leela Ansart, leadership advisor and certified executive coach. On this podcast, you'll hear the stories of successful individuals and how they were able to overcome adversity by channeling strength from an internal driving force. My mission, shine the light on alternate strategies that can move you from reactive to strategic thinking, from overwhelmed to motivated, and from burnout to balance, so you can move forward and over-deliver on your current goals. Let's dive in. Today's guest on Fuel Podcast is Tanya Vucetic. She's the CEO and co-founder of a software startup called Blockforms. She's a data scientist by profession and has personally built technology ranging from algorithms that recommend which items can and can't be shipped together in a box to monitoring how well you're brushing your teeth with an electric toothbrush. Tanya shares with us today how she launched Blockforms just before the pandemic and is really proud of the fact that with her team, she was able to go from zero traction to having national traction now. We talked about a few different things, how she experienced the highs and lows of being an entrepreneur, especially amidst a worldwide pandemic. We also touch on what drives her in regards to math and science, and also her opinion on leadership, her own personal style of leadership and how that's been influenced by math and by her view on femininity. I know you're gonna get a ton out of this conversation. Without any more delay, let's welcome Tanya. So welcome, Tanya. It's great to talk to you this morning. I'm really, really thrilled to have you here and to have you uh, willing to share your story with the the listeners about who you are and what you've overcome. Why don't you take a minute as we begin to just share a little bit about your background, your professional background, um, you know, help us understand who you are, what makes you tick, and then we'll get into more of the meat of the matter. Alrighty, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and speak with you today. Again, my name is Tony Busetic. I'm the CEO of a company called Blockforms, a software company. And I am originally from California. I'm a beach girl. And I um, studied economics at UCLA. I got my MBA in Hong Kong. And I'm really passionate about math and science. So that led me to a career as a data scientist. And I jumped headfirst into entrepreneurship about three years ago. Wonderful. Wonderful. So those are a lot of cool experiences in regard to your education. Um, What made you decide to go over to Hong Kong? Well, I am a first generation American. My mom's from Mexico and my father's from Serbia. So I have a good grasp of Europe and Central America and South America. I didn't have a sense for Asia at all. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm a pretty adventurous person. And in 2015, I sold everything that I owned and moved to Hong Kong without admittedly being able to point it out on a map. Wow. Okay, so we've got some major bravery uh, in the in your genes here for sure. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a small family, but we're very international, and, and uh, Asia was calling me. Oh, that's wonderful. And how did you find your experience there? It was very enlightening. I um, fancied myself a very international, culturally aware person being from California, originally next to San Francisco, living in Los Angeles now. And it was a very humbling experience to be on someone else's turf and operate under their rules and uh, assimilate that way. So I think it's made me a um, more open, understanding, curious, and empathetic person. Mm. All really important attributes. I always, um, I always tell people when we talk about what they could do to expand their vision of the world, you know, that the main thing is just travel and, and, and travel for fun, travel, you know, with, with the, the Mai Tais on the, <laughs> on the club beach once in a while, but, but more so travel as a local and try to understand the local culture and, and experience it, you know, in a little bit more of an authentic way. I think, um, I've been fortunate to do a little bit of that myself. So it's awesome hearing about other people's experiences and, and feeling like, yeah, you know, it's certainly haven't lived in another, another continent, much less a country, but, um, even just to travel opens up your eyes to so much. 
Definitely. I think it's a crucial part of uh, being a leader because everyone has a different perspective, comes from a different world. And um, I'm very sensitive to my way or the highway or because I said so. I think it's really important to offer an explanation and um, be conscientious of what makes different people from different parts of the world tick and Mm -hmm. traveling is key to doing so. Mm. Were you always that way, Tanya, or did that kind of evolve in you as you had that experience? I think I was because growing up, I didn't, I wasn't American enough. And I was in, Mm. you know, based on my appearance, I'm very fair and blonde. I definitely wasn't recognized as Mexican. And uh, when I am in Serbia, people, you know, I grew up in the U.S., so I'm also not Serbian. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. definitely a mix. So uh, in order to reconcile my own experience as an individual, I think my curiosity for other cultures, whether it's countries or religions or um, even even belief systems, um, yeah, I, I, I've, that's always been the fiber of my being. Mm. I, I, I'm always, I find it interesting when we can take our pain and turn it into, you know, some part of who we are, whether that's part of our purpose or part of our, um, our defining view that we, you know, the lens that we see the world through. Um, so that's awesome. I mean, it's, I'm sure it was difficult many times growing up, not feeling like you had that perfect fit cultural background, you know, or, 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 or present belonging in it because of your cultural background. Um, but look at what that's developed in you, you know, and a strength. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, as the CEO and co-founder of Black Forms, um, I know this. You mentioned you ventured into entrepreneurial uh, territories in th- about three years ago. So we're talking just before the pandemic. Give us the give us the play by play. Like, how did this happen, and and how excited were you? And then when the pandemic happened, you know, we have to know, how did this affect you and your company? Absolutely. So we were sitting around a coffee table ideating on what our software does. And for the listeners, our software automates forms. So really complicated forms are digitized into one form, but you're actually populating all of the forms, saving yourself a lot of time. And uh, we didn't know each other originally. We were introduced by a mutual friend And um, we made a lot of the stereotypical mistakes, especially in the software world of not scoping the product um, perfectly the first time and not understanding our users um, for a long time. And uh, yeah, things evolved, the software became real. And as soon as we started uh, marketing it and applying for accelerator programs, that's when the pandemic hit. So okay. it was really challenging to navigate keeping the spirits of my teammates up and my own spirits up when we had zero traction as a company. And the whole world became very reluctant to make any quick decisions. So all of the conversations we had around um, um, doing like a like a a pilot program or Mm -hmm. even anyone even consider signing just came to a screeching halt. Yeah. And then we started to change our narrative and what does software do? It makes working from home even easier. And um, people, people don't want to spend their time doing data entry, especially alone in their home. So right. Reduce the amount of time people spend doing that. Um, we be- we became quickly more intriguing to our customers. And uh, June of 2021, we signed our first cu- national customer. I say one customer, but it's actually hundreds of users. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yeah, so it nice. sounds like the the um, you know giant stop sign in the middle of the road that that the pandemic was in terms of anyone adopting your software, being willing to try it out, um, was released, I guess, from you shifting. You said, I shifted our narrative. So tell me a little bit about that process. I think that's been the hardest part, the storytelling about why what we've built is 
a necessary tool in the workplace, especially companies that do that have to execute a lot of forms to do business. Um, we started really talking about uh, the insurance space and our target customers were so niche, employee benefits insurance brokers. And that mm-hmm. was important for building the product to really understand their sales cycle because it mirrors a lot of businesses' sales cycle. But when it came to pitching, whether it was investors or customers, we were way too narrow. So we needed to zoom out because truthfully, the product is industry agnostic. We can we can build this, uh, adapt the solution to any forms. And the pandemic really tested us to do so because these insurance brokerages, so much red tape, they are massive. It's hard to get the right person in front of you to have this conversation, let alone um, getting them to make a decision on behalf of such a huge organization. Mm-hmm. And while, while we are doing so, and it's necessary because these contracts are, are awesome in their size, it's just a longer sales cycle. So then we had, then we decided to zoom out a little bit and go for adjacent industries, or even one of our customers is in the property management space. And those were a lot uh, easier deals to close because we changed our narrative. Mm. Interesting. How much of that was a trial by fire experience? And all of, uh, it. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> all of it, just throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, yeah. it, that's entrepreneurship, right? There's no, there's yeah. no manual. You just have to keep going and take feedback, incorporate that feedback, and um, a- adapt it to whatever you're trying to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And the the valleys and the peaks that entrepreneur that the entrepreneur journey brings are thrilling and depressing (laughs) (laughs) consecutively over and over if you're truly honest about it. Um, You know, that that journey is one that requires so much personal resilience and so much internal fortitude. What I on this podcast, I like to call fuel What do you think was, you know, amidst all of these, these, you know, these obstacles that you've sort of breezed over? Well, you know, we were, we were just talking to customers and then the pandemic hit like one sentence, right? But it's, it's recent enough. We all know that was a giant freaking book, not just a sentence. That was, you know, so many obstacles all rolled into one title, the pandemic, you know, what through all of this, Tanya, what kept you going? What was the driving force, you know, besides the obvious, we all need to eat (laughs) and sleep somewhere safe. Uh, Besides the obvious, you know, what was the thing that that kept you going here? I would say it's two things. Uh, One being, I really believe in the product. I have no reservations about the potential of its growth and its usefulness to the average person. But the second thing being my teammates, I, I don't know if I would have survived being a solopreneur. Uh, the fact that we are a team that made this commitment to each other and that um, we, we all went through the same emotional experience, fortunately, at different times. So we could, you know, lift the chin up of each other when one of us was feeling down. But that was huge to our survival over 2020. Mm. That's awesome. And how, um, how important is this idea of, you know, uh, math and science careers? You know, how important is that idea to you individually? I think it goes extraordinarily important. And I think it goes back to that identity crisis as a small girl, because one thing that is, I find math so beautiful and empowering and even feminine and, for me, it was a common language across everyone. Like my grandmother who didn't speak English could help me with my math homework. And um, it has been a tool that has opened so many doors for me. Mm-hmm. And my passion for math and getting particularly young kids excited about math and even more specifically young girls is what motivates me to um uh, lead by example and eventually dedicate myself to that work. 
Mm, that's really beautiful. I know when you and I talked before, um, we got the, the pleasure of chatting a little bit prior to today's discussion. You talked about that you see math and science as feminine. And I love that because I've never heard anyone say that. And I really want to hear more about what you mean by that, if you would share. Sure. I, I have given this subject a lot of thought and growing up, being good at math and science was always labeled masculine. And I, I think it's because when we're small, we quickly label things as good or bad. And, and that's part of our maturation into adulthood. But um, I find math very delicate. For instance, one thing's wrong, the whole thing falls apart. I find it very powerful and femininity is very powerful. Um, It's global. It's, it's uh, international. And that's where I, I extract the, the femininity from mathematics and science. So that's really interesting. I think, um, you know, I think as so many individuals that I know, and there's certainly a movement around encouraging girls to pursue STEM, to pursue the math and the science careers. And, and addressing the fact that so many girls, you know, sort of lose their confidence in those fields in their, their, um, you know, their, their, their first double digits, as my daughter calls them, my daughter who's 14. Um, so it's interesting to me the way you described it. I don't think I've ever heard it described in that way. And how would you, if you were talking to a young man, how would you, you know, equate that, that metaphor? I think men embracing femininity, first of all, is extremely important. There are uh, many men out there who are detail-oriented, who um, work in hyper-specific jobs and are very empathetic as individuals. And the fact that we even label these things as masculine and feminine is is dangerous when we, as human beings, embody both. Mm -hmm. And my tendency to lean on math and science as being feminine is to compensate for the mislabel of it being a masculine trade. I completely agree with you. And we didn't even get to go here on our initial discussion. So I'm, I'm actually quite excited to talk to you about this. Um, I feel like uh, labels have meaning, you know, label an experience and you change the the emotional experience that you had. You say, you know, you come home from a hard day and you say, man, that day sucked. You have an emotional reaction when you put that label on it versus saying, man, it was a difficult day. I really showed how my resilience, you know, pushed me through. You could call that whatever you might, but your emotional response comes from the labels that you use. I firmly believe in that. I'm a big believer in the power of language and how it affects us, et cetera. So I've always thought, you know, these terms of masculine and feminine, I think they're a bit outdated. I would like to see a new term. And I have a few ideas of my own that I'm not ready to share. I'll I'll tell that to, to you offline. Um, But I think that it might benefit us to consider, like you said, the fact that we embody, as humans, we embody both. We have the ability to be um, strikingly empathetic. We have the ability to be quick decision makers and lead a group and be uh, um, more driven in in, in our communication and decision making approach. We have both of those. So why must we choose one And why does it have to be so polarizing to be, you know, one or the other versus just what is the type of energy I need for this situation? And how can I step into that type of energy and develop that in myself? When I was younger working in finance, I thought that I needed to be more intense and assertive and not wear makeup, pull my hair back in a bun, wear clogs to work. And it took me a long time to unlearn those things and really enjoy all aspects of myself and celebrate that I like to wear earrings and I I like to wear colorful clothing and and that has nothing to do with my job. Right. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you here and everything that you said, it's, we, we are, um, multifaceted and 
I am not an intense, um, aggressive person at all. I lead my company through nurturing and listening and, um, and then in return, my co-founders are always like, Tanya, take the lead and pushing me onto the, onto the pedestal. And we have just the best dynamic. Mm. It's interesting. So many companies right now, you know, we're talking about post COVID. We're talking about this era of the great, um, the great resignation, the great reshuffle, whatever you want to call it. So many people leaving their organizations for something better because we're all kind of a little tired little disheartened, maybe not all. Okay. Maybe there's a few (laughs) that aren't. So for those of you listening, I give you a pass, (laughs) but the far majority of those that I talk to in in the the work that I do are um, quite often, unless their, their company has a very intentional culture, they're tired, they're worn out. They're realizing that, you know, maybe, maybe a realization that would have taken them another 10 years to get to that things need to be better in the workplace. And so much of that stems back to company culture. And in my opinion, so much of that stems back to leadership and the type of leadership that you choose to employ in dealing with your talent and your people. So you mentioned as a leader, you lead with a more feminine, what you would call, well, maybe since we've said that's out of date, maybe we need to just say a more empathetic approach. what do you think has been the impact of that in terms of retention, in terms of motivation of your team? The fact that we're all still together after how hard it's been, I think, is um, speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, even even in times of um, low cash flow, people have been willing to be patient for being compensated because not only do they believe in the product, but they believe in the team. And part of that is attributed to leadership style. Mm. Life is hard. We're all humans in our small team alone. We've had divorce. We've had parents getting sick. We've had people getting married. And a lot of that is, and and people moving across the country, it's, it's being a human being. And when I reflect back on my career up until this point, uh, Everything is about the people that you work with. What you're actually doing on a day-to-day basis is, for me, a much smaller uh, component of my overall happiness and and health when it comes to the workplace. Yeah. Yeah, so true. Tanya, do you have any specific stories um, that you could share around, you know, this drive that you have around your team pulling together, around your passion for, you know, women and girls embracing the math and the sciences. I mean, give us some, give us a a story to help us get to know you even a little better. Okay. Which story do I want to pick and how, how recent do I want to be? Um, I always get asked about my experience as a woman in male dominated industries And it's a complicated question because I've never been a man. I have nothing else to compare it to, Mm. but I do very much have my experience. And one of the jobs that changed my life most was when I was in my early to mid twenties and I was working for an aircraft leasing company, working in uh, doing valuation, pricing the leases of commercial jets. And the people there were very supportive of my career, men leaving books on my uh, desk, pointing me to which chapters to look at when it comes to you know, credit, risk evaluation. And um, in the same environment, I had one individual who insisted to help me to the point where I felt really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And even locked me in his office at one point and told me to go ahead and report him into to HR and he would end my career in aviation finance. Oh my goodness. And that was an important experience for me because it wasn't about what happened to me, but I had to be very careful in how I reacted. And I didn't go to HR because I didn't have a lot of faith in our HR, but I did go to my boss who spoke to then his boss and all of the other men that worked with me really supported me through 
that impossible threat and uncomfortable situation. Hmm. And my, my takeaway from that experience that I, I want to share with the listeners is to always communicate what's going on and not be afraid of these environments where the demographics are, are not identical to your own because the majority of people are on your side. Things happen, but the way that it, the people I actually work directly with resolve the situation really empowered me to keep going mm-hmm. and keep trusting other people. So don't be afraid of math and science because the environment isn't a bunch of people who look at like you yet. It will <laughs> be. <laughs> um, because there are more people are good than bad. I firmly believe that as well. And I, I think um, I think depending on individuals' experiences, that can be an easier truth to align with or not. Um, but I think, you know, there's, as the saying goes, there's a bad apple in every bunch. And I think it's less about uh, pointing out the bad apple and point instead pointing out the the experiences that we have in common with each other, where we want to get ahead, we want to have a meaningful life, we want to be able to work with people that we respect, um, who drive us, who inspire us, and whom we can make a difference to as well. So that's a it's a good reminder and it's solid advice to perhaps take a take a step back from the typical what's it like to be a woman in a male dominated industry and instead think about well that that is what it is right now but instead let's choose to look at the 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 good in humanity that surrounds us so much of the time thank you for sharing that of course um mentors come in all uh, shapes and sizes and forms so Mm -hmm. i've been very fortunate that i uh have been led by some pretty impressive people, both men and women. That's awesome. Tanya, tell us a little bit about what's next for your company, for Blockforms, and uh, what listeners can do to get involved, to reach out to you. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, So Blockforms is fundraising right now, and I have decided to do a portion of that fundraising view via equity crowdfunding. So what that means is you do not need to be an accredited investor. The minimum investment level is a hundred bucks. I just wanted it to be very accessible for the average person. And we're doing so through a platform called micro ventures. I believe you'll be able to access the link easily from this um, podcast recording. Yes. And uh, what's what's next for us for fundraising so we can grow. We have more demand than we can handle. We're excited to develop this uh, software as a more off-the-shelf solution. Right now, it's very specific to the large enterprises that are using this software, but ultimately, this is something that, or eventually, this will be something that an individual can buy for their own small practice, whether they're a dentist or they're running bookkeeping. We're all dealing with forms, so... Mm. Um, the company's name again is Blockforms, and we're on MicroVentures. And my uh, name is Tanya Bucetic. I think I'm the only one on LinkedIn since my last name is so <laughs> unique, but um, my LinkedIn contact details are also attached to this podcast recording. Yes, absolutely. And if you are right now heading over to LinkedIn to look up Tanya, her last name is V U C E T I C. Tanya V U C E T I C. It has been amazing, Tanya, to chat with you and kind of hear about your journey and and the life lessons that you've um, you've experienced and have been willing to share with uh, with me and with the listeners. So thank you so much for your generosity and sharing. And uh, for all the listeners out there, I do urge you to to look up Tanya, check out Blockforms and what they're doing. And if you're inspired and want to be a part of helping her business to grow, take a look at the fundraising link that we'll have in the podcast notes, and you can be a part of her journey as well. Until we talk again, Tanya, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and I look forward to speaking with you again soon. This podcast is brought to you by Leadership Impact Strategies. We help today's business leaders to navigate the people challenges of this pandemic era 
With a focus on compassionate leadership, we help you eliminate team dysfunction and increase your own leadership capability, resulting in higher profits, sales, and results to your bottom line. Like what you heard on today's episode? Turbocharge your own leadership by grabbing our free resources. Discover your leadership strengths and potential blind spots with our leadership quiz, or grab our free checklist for holding an engaging team meeting. Find them both and more at www.leadershipimpactstrategies.com forward slash resources. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to Fuel Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts so you'll be notified of every new episode. Until then, I'm Leela Ansart. Here's to you finding the fuel you need today. Hey, hey, hey.